So hello, um, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. I have the great honor to welcome Kirk Wiebe and William Binney, who are going to update us on the um, outcomes of the targeted uh, individual survey, which they launched in 2017, and um, on the steps that uh, they are going to take, uh, you know, or we're going to take after that. Uh, I don't really have to introduce Bill and Kirk to the targeting community because they are big leading lights. Um, to those of you who are new to my channel, uh, Bill Binney is the former technical director of NSA. He was um, the person who devised and designed um, a lot, if not the majority of the programs they're using today. Uh, Kirk Wiebe is a senior intelligence, uh, intelligence analyst who has been with NSA, I think over 30 years, Kirk, is that right? That's correct. And uh, Kirk and uh, Bill uh, were working together on something that's called Thin Thread. And for those of you um, who don't know, Thin Thread was uh, an encrypted way of monitoring uh, the internet uh, transmissions for terrorist activity and criminal activity that preserved everybody's privacy. So the data as it was being collected was encrypted and not even the analysts within NSA could actually look into the data, look at the um, identities of people. So things like love int and other nefarious activity was not possible. And this software thin thread was completed and deployed, I think in January, 2001, and was then I think deactivated by NSA management as I understand. And the uh, very sad thing is that um, thin thread would actually have picked up the terrorist activity that led to 9-11 and a mass murder of um, thousands of people. So welcome uh, Bill and Kirk. And I have to say thank you from, you know, from my heart and thank you in the name of the targeted individual community for getting into this topic of uh, the targeting program and running the survey. I, back in the day, that was a big, big spark of hope you know, for all of us. So uh, who would like to start? Kirk, would you like to start and give us some background on what you have been doing? Yes, sure. Thank you, uh, Catherine, for that kind introduction. Um, Bill and I, uh, many of you already know, um, began looking into the targeting issue uh, a number of years ago. Uh, we had heard about it prior to about 2016, but really hadn't um, talked to enough people that had experienced it, hadn't really researched it. But I would tell you this, even back then, Bill and I, based on our experience with the government, knew that uh, very high frequencies were being used in various capacities to either eavesdrop or on or target, meaning harm, causing harm to people. Um, <clears throat> 30 years ago, we knew about that. What we did not realize is that it seems, based on the survey and um, other anecdotal information, to have grown uh, in, in its um, effect globally. Uh, so that now it's far more advanced. And when we do go out and research the topic of directed energy, we find even DOD, Department of Defense documents, that will mention it, they won't give you a lot of detail, but they do acknowledge experimentation. And since then, we've even read articles about other countries developing these kinds of weapons uh, for crowd control. And uh, you know, the only difference between controlling a crowd and killing a crowd is power. How much power does the energy deliver to the target? So um, we've um, come quite a, quite a long way in the last four or five years mm -hmm. and are here to, uh, we're here to address next steps. Bill? Yeah, that's uh, our, our thrust now is to move into getting sworn affidavits from as many people as possible to support the court case that Catherine has initiated in the, in the courts in London. Uh, and we, we have uh, some uh, substantial evidence to be able to uh, show that these kinds of things are happening. And also, we have a preponderance of evidence of the numbers of people who are being affected by these kinds of activities. So uh, that's really the foundation of it, just trying to get 
more people to get involved and more people to commit to doing sworn affidavits in for a court, both in London and eventually we'd like to do it here in the United States too. Uh, so it's a matter of moving around and in the EU also, I mean, wherever this is occurring, we need to take in the, they take this evidence and uh, what have you into court. And of course, when you have these sworn affidavits, they're public and anybody can use them in any court case they want to start in their own country. So it's, a, it's now getting to the point where we need to consolidate hardcore evidence with testimony and put it in a court of law. And that's, uh, I think, the thrust of what we got from the initial survey, which helped us understand a lot more about targeting. Kirk and I really didn't uh, have that much knowledge of targeting or how, how, how it was affecting people before this survey started. So uh, this has basically helped us understand a lot more too. And then of course, Catherine came through uh, and now we're joining forces with Catherine to, to assist in any way we can with her court case. Uh, and so we'll bring our expertise to that and uh, hopefully anybody else who wants to uh, join in and add their uh, weight in a sworn affidavit for the courts, uh, you're, you're all welcome. And I think Catherine will be posting the, uh, or has already posted the sworn affidavit format that she's suggesting people use. Uh, and that if everybody uses that, that will be more helpful too. Yeah, you know, as, as a small background uh, to my viewers, one of the things I would like to say is that um, over the last weeks, um, you know, especially Bill and I, um, I've been working very closely together. So I've traveled to the Uni uh, United States a couple of times. And I mean, Bill, you can probably confirm that you saw me actually with your own eyes being yeah. uh, attacked in front of you. So, you know, it's, it's basically, I think the first thing that all the victim community need to realize is that both um, you and, and Kirk are very aware of what's going on. You know um, that people are being attacked and are being targeted. I mean, Bill really saw it with his own eyes. And uh, we were trying to collect evidence of these attacks as they were occurring. Mm -hmm. And I think we also succeeded and that will be submitted in my court case. But also what, what we all know is that the scale of this is so much bigger than the attacks on just on me or just my witnesses. Um, so one of the things I would like to say is, and I would like to ask your, your experience with this, but when I first came into the targeting community, I had basically two fundamental problems in trying to communicate with other victims and trying to learn what's even going on. Number one was that a lot of victims do not have the technical background because they couldn't have it. It's classified technology, but they don't have the technical background and the scientific um, education to really be able to pinpoint and articulate what's being done. So it took me a long time to disentangle all the different uh, modes of attack. And the second uh, problem that I had, and I, I, you know, I guess that your survey might also have suffered from that, is mm -hmm. I detected um, intelligence agents and their botnets or email farms spamming me with mm -hmm. essentially garbage to try to muddy the waters, to try to make it more difficult for me to get through to genuine <clears throat> victims and find out what exactly were the genuine uh, symptoms and the typical modes of attack and what was just made up nonsense that kind of resembled a targeted um, individual but wasn't really such. You know, is that something that you also found in your survey that it was very hard to get through? Uh, yes, uh, uh, a lot of the things that I had, um, and I went through an awful lot of emails trying to figure out what, what could contribute to a case, you know, what would be substantial evidence for a, to put into a court, and what would be uh, tangible to show and prove, the, uh, prove what's really happening. But, you know, even, I would say, even what's happening now, you can get symptoms of it and indications of it, but we can't really yet focus in on it. We don't even know the technology to do that yet. But we're certainly trying different things. And I think that uh, the idea behind it is as we discover things, uh, we'll try to disseminate them. But uh, this is not going to be easy, even for us, so who have uh, scientific, like Catherine, you're a particle physicist with a PhD, and I have a mathematics degree, you know, and Kirk is a linguist and analyst. And even our, uh, our abilities are, it's really still difficult for us to deal with this. So yeah. it's not, I mean, we're not saying that this is something that uh, the average person can really deal with. I mean, it's, I think it's beyond anybody's uh, capacity. Even the, even the, for example, if they're using pulse things, meaning multiple frequencies in a very short 
pulse, uh, then you need something like a wide band stare at the spectrum that moves through the spectrum to find all the spikes. That's not a cheap piece of equipment and nobody could, nobody in the commercial environment, I mean, there, there, there are things that are sold commercially, but they are not cheap. And so it's not something that individuals can really afford to do, unless you're relatively rich, you know? Well, and, and I would add to that, Bill, that, uh, and Catherine, that when one looks out at the world of uh, uh, detection, energy detection, by far the majority of detectors on the market focus on frequency bands that uh, begin uh, maybe a megahertz, maybe two megahertz up to infinity. And they go very high, but there's very little that's looking at the lower frequency, uh, even sub audible. And we're talking two hertz up to about 20 hertz. That's two cycles to 20 cycles. And we need more detection capability in that area uh, because it appears that some of the more recent technologies based on sound or sub sound, remember the human ear can only hear up to about 20 Hertz beginning down, um, down below, I'm sorry, 20 Hertz to about 20 kilohertz, I believe. Isn't that right? Do I have that right? Um, the audio range, what I'm, my point is energy can occur below that range and we may need more detection uh, efforts in that, in that area. Actually, this is one thing that I, I also, um, you know, was very, very obvious as I was talking to you. I mean, first of all, you know, as you indicated, Kirk, we have, first of all, acoustic um, ways that can hit and harm people. There are also electromagnetic uh, ways that can um, hit and harm people. Those are two fundamentally different ways and weapons technologies have been developed in either category. And in both categories, the frequency range that mm -hmm. is available for detection in the civilian range is very limited. And for example, I mean, you mentioned the acoustic range that anything subaudible can't be detected, yet it can actually cause harm oh. of various forms and cause, cause physical ailments. Now in the electromagnetic range, uh, it's true. And actually when uh, it's, you mentioned that the, the range is infinite, actually the detection are, is not even that, it's, it's min minuscule. It goes up to, I mean, the best detectors are maybe in the few or a few dozen gigahertz range. Yes. And one weapons expert from Belgium said to me, you know, they could easily attack you with what, 300 gigahertz? There isn't detection on the market that you can buy that could ever detect that, you know? So if you're lucky, you can detect it by some secondary means, but not really, you know? And I think at the end of the day, one of the things that crystallized from these the um, survey uh, answers that you got, and also the what I collected, is that whatever is attacking people is advanced military technology. And I think it should also be emphasized that it certainly is out of my prior knowledge. Um, and I, I'm, well, I've worked in high energy physics. Mm -hmm. That was really high energy, but I've never come across even some of the physical phenomena that I have experienced. Um, but it's also outside what you two are familiar with. And we're really talking with, uh, you know, Bill, you were the, um, the uh, your full title. So it, uh, that was the technical director for the- I was, I, I was the technical director for the World Geopolitical and Military Analysis and Reporting Shop. That was about 6,000 analysts at NSA. Yeah, and, and basically <laughs> you, you said to me that you have never really, you know, come across anything that would have indicated this targeting program or the detailed weapons that were used. And you were kind of in, in charge of watching <laughs> nuclear, you know, stockpiles and stuff, right? Well, but the, we did know at the time though that the, the Russians were targeting our embassy personnel in Moscow with microwave radiation. So, and of course you had the recent stuff with Havana, Cuba and our embassy down there. So. We did know that certain things were happening, yeah. And I mean, you know, this is also when I when I talk to Kirk, and I should say that Kirk um, has uh, quite a lot of experience as a ham radio operator. So he's really, you know, on top of uh, anything to do with measurement and picking up uh, radio signals and antenna systems. And still when we discussed, you know, I, I think it's fair to say, Kirk, right, that uh, the kind of phenomena we were talking about is not something that even maybe you know experts like you would have come across necessarily. No, that's right. Because um, in in the natural world, uh, we're familiar with with emissions, 
But when you have um, human efforts to deceive or hide emissions, you have to look uh, outside the box, so to speak, and, and have a very open mind to alternate types of um, energy transmission. As you say, uh, sonic is one, radio frequency is another, but they're two different phenomena and uh, must be detected differently. Um, and so, yeah, that's the challenge. And uh, we're not there yet. As Bill mentioned, this is still a hard problem, which I might say, since your audience is sizable, all of you, uh, we would ask, if you have hard evidence, anything available to support our next phase of supporting the uh, TI community, please make it available to us. Um, we need more anecdotal stories are good, but they're not final in, the, in terms of scientific proof. So anything, anything that you might have, we encourage you to contact uh, Catherine Horton and uh, to submit it uh, and make it available. And we promise to keep it confidential, by the way. Yeah. Actually, um, so this is one thing I, I wanted to say is that uh, Bill mentioned the um, affidavit under oath um, that we, we ask victims to supply for, for the court case if they want to take part in the court case, or if they want to, um, you know, testify about these, um, these crimes. And, um, you know, also the evidence that's being submitted. Now, it very much depends. Um, I have received some evidence from victims. I can't put everything into this particular court case in the first instance, but that's not even necessary because what really all the victims need is a court case where they are the main litigants. You know, However, any supporting evidence that I can provide to this court will back up my case and will help to establish that these crimes are really going on and that we need a court mechanism to stop them. Now, as I want to really emphasize the confidentiality here because this was a very, very important topic for me when I was um, collecting the affidavits under oath. So um, I, if, if I may, I just would like to share my screen to show people where the, uh, they can get the affidavit template that we are using at the moment and that have produced some results. And then I also would like to point out how they can send me evidence. But the bottom line is that the only people who would ever look at the affidavits that are submitted and the evidence are us three. So this is not shared with anybody right. at all. So neither Bill, Kirk, nor I share your private information with anybody out there. Yep. Um, for the affidavits that are submitted uh, as part of the, um, the affidavit collection, I an uh, anonymize them and I publish them in, uh, anonymously. And I'll show you how I do that so that nobody's identity can be revealed. And then to submit them for my court case, I have to use them with full information, which is name, address, and the photo ID where the serial number is blacked out so that the copy can't be used for identity fraud. Um, but all of this just stays with me. It isn't shared with third parties. However, as every victim knows and every person on the planet knows by now probably, everything you send digitally will be intercepted by NSA and will be shared with GCHQ and a bunch of others. So none of our data is actually private. But then again, when you are um, going to the doctor and have an x-ray taken, most people don't realize that actually their data between the x-ray machine and the doctor's office is very often sent over, not just an internal network, but the internet. That's how the devices are set up. So in a sense, your x-ray before it reaches uh, your doctor is already sent to NSA and stored forever. So. What I'm trying always to say to victims is your privacy is super important and we're doing our best. But remember that not even your doctor can guard your privacy under the current mm. circumstances. So be paranoid and be protective about your identity, but don't be so paranoid that it stops you from actually, uh, you know, helping and, and progressing with your case. But, um, you know, that said, as far as um, us three are concerned, it's really just any information that's sent to us stays in our email inboxes, gets downloaded as a backup to our computers and stays with us. It's not shared with any third parties. There are no other people involved here. Now, I would like to share my screen. And um, for those people who are, who are new and haven't filled out an affidavit yet, I would like to show you um, 
the work that I have done in the past. And um, okay, I should also say, so here's the, um, let me share the website. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get back to Zoom. Okay. So um, you can get, uh, is this visible? Can you see this? Yes. It's <clears throat> jointinvestigation.org and the JIT is the joint investigation team between US and Europe um, related to directed energy weapons, military new neural slash biotechnology and systemic corruption. Now, this is a team that I started a long time ago and that is really what I drew the um, affidavit template um, um, you know, what I designed a Def David template for. And this team started um, in the olden days, it included um, Karen Melton Stewart, an NSA whistleblower, Dr. Millicent Black, Melanie Richan, Ra Mola Dal Maraj, and myself. And we had the Techno Crime Fighters Forum as a weekly update. Now, in the background, I started this affidavit survey, and then the joint investigation team members left, and I was left to um, continue the affidavit survey on my own. So um, now, here on the joint investigation team uh, website under appeals, this was the appeal for affidavits, okay? And the first link, appeal for victim affidavits, mm. contains the template that you can download and fill out. And the second one, international affidavits, are the already submitted responses. So what I ask victims to do is go here to appeal for affidavits. And here is a PDF um, that you can, uh, you know, click on and actually see what the survey looks like. So here's the PDF and I'll get back to this, but I want to point out that you cannot fill out the PDF. You have to download um, the editable format, which is this one here in the middle. That's an open office format. An open office is like Microsoft Word, uh, but it's for free and it's available on all platforms. So Android, Windows, um, Mac and, um, and Linux systems, okay? So I ask um, victims to fill it out in the open office format, convert it to PDF when they are finished and send me the final result. I uh, also- would, I, yeah? If I'm, if I'm uh, understanding, uh, they fill it out in open office. Yeah. Uh, do they save it as PDF or do they save it as open office format and then convert it? And if that's the case, how do they convert it? So when you open, um, so when you open the Open Office Writer application, it looks just like Microsoft Word, richly identical. And you fill it out in Open Office, and you save it in Open Office as you're editing it. And as the final step, there's a little PDF button, and if you print it, that converts it into a format where your results can't be modified afterwards. It's just a PDF of the final results. And I basically asked victims to send me that. So when you say print it, you're not literally printing it on your computer. It's sort of like save as PDF. Exactly, save as PDF, yes. Oh, gotcha. Yes. Um, and, and sorry, I use the word print because sometimes when you um, print, use the print function on a website, it allows you to send it to a printer or say print to PDF, in which case it appears as a file on your computer. Exactly. So when people do that, they have the open office format, which they can always go back to and edit. But when everything is complete, um, then I ask them to uh, please, you know, press that button at the top and then convert it to PDF and send me the PDF version because the PDF version can't be modified by me by accident and so on. So their results are, you know, safe. I would like to point out a few more things that are very, very important for the victims to know. Everything that you need to know is summarized in, in this document here called the explanatory notes, okay? And there, you don't have to read the whole thing, but if you have a question, it's probably answered in here. There's a quick guide for how to fill it out and, 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 but at the very bottom, okay, the things you need to know is that there are screenshots, hang on, let me get to the screenshots, that explain basically um, here. Here's a screenshot that shows you how to convert the, your document into a PDF, what it looks like, what to press. But also at the very end of all this, I'm, I basically sign this document. And what I'm saying in this document is legally binding. So in this document, I explain what the survey is being used for. <coughs> I have written it and that I will only use, use the answers that I get for my court case in that case, the full answers, and otherwise to analyze the crimes being committed, 
okay? But that's an, an anonymized form, mm. all right? And what I want victims to know is when they fill out the affidavit template and send it back to me, they have this document with my signature on that this is what I use their data for, nothing else. This isn't a data harvesting operation or something like that. So I wanted to give um, people this sort of um, assurance, but furthermore, um, on the document that the victims fill out themselves, let me, oops, there's a PDF version here that's easy to view. I included the, the raw data. On the front page, this is what the affidavit start looks like when you fill it out. Here you write your full name, okay? And then the very first paragraph is an oath that you're saying the truth in this affidavit, okay? And then below that, yeah. this section called permissions for use, this is a legally binding test of a statement about how you give permission for your data to be used, okay? And it basically says that you're granting permission to me as the founder and lead investigator of the joint investigation team to use your affidavit without limitation in support of my court case and that you grant um, permission to um, me and the joint investigation team to use the affidavit for the analysis and reporting of the crimes committed against victims. And it's very important the rep reports shall not identify me by name. Okay, and then the final sentence says that you give permission for pages two to 93, the anonymous bit, to be published online. Okay, so anybody who uses this template has full control over how their data can legally be used. Okay, that, that is very, very important, especially for targeting victims who have been human trafficked and medically trafficked in a million ways. So for me, what's important is that this is entirely aimed at court cases, which is why it contains an oath at the very beginning. Then it's a, it's a tick box format, and I'll explain why in a moment. And at the very end, people sign this under a statement of truth, okay? And the signature should be witnessed by a person entitled to administer oath. And it's all explained in the um, explanatory notes. You can find a person who can witness a signature uh, very easily, it can be a notary public or it can even be an employee at the bank. In some countries, even the post office can witness signatures and your local council can do it. And typically it shouldn't cost more than $5 to do. So it's, it's very simple and everybody has done it. But here's the clincher. As soon as you do that and you write something under oath and you have your signature witnessed, that is basically a document that you can use in court um, anywhere in the world certainly anywhere in the English speaking world. Okay, it counts as that, sorry. So what you're saying then, Catherine, is that should we open a case in the United States, all of these documents will be usable again. Absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing that victims um, should know is that what, what we are saying is they are very welcome to fill out the affidavit template and send it to us, number one, for our education that we understand the crimes. Number two, that we can actually do a large scale analysis on, on them and write reports that we can send to police, to governments, to, um, you know, as expert testimonies to courts. This is our, you know, knowledge base. But also they, can, they would become, if they send it to me specifically, they, I would submit it in my court case as a witness testimony and ask for a protective injunction for these people as, as my witness, okay? So that is kind of a, a benefit that people would get. So they would be noted by the court as a testifying witness and um, you, know, you are entitled to protection um, uh, by the courts. But the final um, step that people need to realize is that they don't even have to send us the affidavit. If they want to be stay private, and they don't want to communicate with us and they don't want to um, be part of my court case, that is okay too. But then even then they benefit from filling out the affidavit because they can fill out the affidavit and download all the other affidavits that I have published already, which are documents under oath, which they can download and use as supporting evidence for their own private court case without telling anybody about it. So you know, whichever way um, people want to use it, they get a lot of benefits this way. And um, let me just share my screen one more time and take people to the, um, to the point where they can uh, do it. So in a sense, what I'm publishing is this document, but I strip the final page, which has the signatures on, 
you know, for the statement of truth. And I stripped the first page, hang on, let me scroll up to the first page here, which has the name and the address of the, um, of the victims, okay? When what I'm publishing is the anonymous bit, which is just, you know, tick boxes here that shows what offenses have been committed, how frequently, and so on and so on. And this affidavit template contains every single offense that I've ever come across being reported by the victims. It's meant to be completely all inclusive. Now, if you fill out this affidavit template, I'm just gonna click the back button a couple of times. So this was the appeal for affidavits. And if I go back a page here on the joint investigation team website, below the appeal, you'll get the section international affidavits. And here you can download, at the moment there are 42 affidavits under oath here. You can download every single one, but actually uh, since then I've received, I think over 60. So over the coming uh, days and weeks, I'll upload many more affidavits. And in a sense, you can go now and click on any of these, uh, click on the PDF and you already have, you know, these things filled out that you can use. And what I did also is that I, at the very top of this page, because the signatures and the oaths have been stripped, I have wrote, written a document where I say that every single affidavit that appears on this website has been submitted to me with uh, a signed statement of truth under oath and with a witness signature, okay? So here again, you have my signature and you can actually use this document in court to prove that the, the su supporting evidence that you are showing is valid, okay? And should the court have a problem with that, they can contact me and ask me, you know, for the proof. So what I really try to do is cover all the bases and ensure that victims have number one, complete protection of their privacy, you know, um, but can benefit from each other's testimonies, you know, by just having the anonymous part of each other's um, victim affidavit. So that, that's the idea. Now, this is the affidavits that um, Bill was talking about. And um, you two already mentioned that we're working on getting more forensic and scientifically valid evidence. But Genuinely, what we all three are struggling with is that at the moment, we're not even sure ourselves how exactly to measure it. So in the background, we are running little scientific experiments to try to measure various things. And we're trying, we're hoping to learn, you know, a bit more. And, and you know, in this department, I'm really benefiting from Kirk's input because he has all this knowledge about how to measure radio mm -hmm. frequencies and has a lot of experience with antennas and power and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, and I would add, Catherine, that um, I would share with your viewers uh, the recent experiment you did uh, uh, with Bill uh, to actually manifest audibly the sound that you can't hear with a sonic pulse weapon that occurs below human audio range, which I just confirmed is between 20 cycles or 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. But this occurs mm. below that. So you don't hear it unless you bring some other element into the beam and it hits it. So I'd love you to tell that story what both of you told me. Yeah. I, I mean, you, Bill, you can, you know, you can add, um, add in, you know, the, the details that I miss out. In a sense, what I did is I was trying to show um, Bill. Um, so uh, he, uh, he and I, we met up and we ran this experiment together. And what I did is I was trying to make audible uh, and demonstrate the effect of these pulsed energy projectiles because I'm being shot by them wherever I go, in every single hotel room, wherever I stay. So um, we put up these huge aluminum panels and sure, sure enough, as soon as I sit down or lie down pretending to rest, I'll get attacked. So what Bill noted is that, um, I think it's fair to say you can confirm this, right? If I'm correct, if I say something wrong, but we heard um, the, and we also saw the impact of these pulsed energy projectiles on the foil. We saw that and we heard it, but we also heard loud thud impact sounds as these shots were being fired into the walls around us. Can you confirm that, Bill? 
Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. And uh, the, the idea we, we had was to put up multiple panels so that once you got an impact on one, if, if it also impacted in the other, we could get a bearing on the origin of that signal just by tracing, back tracing a line, much like police do with a, uh, when the, a bullet is fired into a wall, they, they put a long rod in there and then the rod points back to the origin of the shot. So that's the kind of thing we were trying to, to establish here. And we're still working on that. And, uh, but uh, we can tell uh, in general, this, the, the direction is coming from, but we need to get a little more accuracy in our, uh, in our measurements. And we are thinking of ways of being able to do that and if it works out and we come up with something that works, why we can tell everybody how we did it. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, one of the things that I guess our little experiment showed is that a lot of the shots, not all, but a lot of the shots were actually coming from above, which would imply that the building was being shot by, you know, maybe a drone that was circling, you know, in a figure of eight above our head and um, was shooting us repeatedly. Yep. But we have run this experiment several times and we also have evidence of being shot horizontally. So that would imply, uh, you know, a weapon planted somewhere, you know, ground level. This could be at the neighboring, neighboring line, building, a neighboring line, yeah. building anywhere. Yeah, and and one of the things that um, Bill and I, I mean, what Bill yeah. also witnessed is that um, we were driving in a car together. And at some point I felt being um, basically gunned in the head from behind, from a vehicle behind. And I asked that, you know, Bill pull over as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. When he did, the pain stopped and this huge pickup truck, red pickup truck overtook us. So we just stayed in the parking bay for a few moments for me to recover. And then we mm -hmm. pulled out, pulled back on the street. And lo and behold, by the time we reached the next street corner, that red pickup van had actually stopped had turned around and was coming back our way. So it was almost like it had stopped to, you know, get us real good this time, you know. And that was, I mean, it was very, very shocking, but I pointed out the van, I pointed down the number plate, and then sure enough, at the next corner, there it is again, you know, and it's just pulled a UE, literally, moments after we pulled over. So um, it's, it's things like that. And, and also, of course, Bill saw the dark disc that has been branded into my forehead permanently. That comes from attacks like this on the on the motorway in Germany and, and Switzerland. So um, yeah, so I it, it's so important I think for the victims to know that there are professionals and experienced professionals out there who really understand that this is going on. And I'm just I'm just so grateful to you, Bill and Kirk, that you actually give us you know the time and uh, you know your support in trying to investigate these crimes. It's, it's a horrific thing, you know, having to deal with, but it, it really helps having people like you on board. Yeah, well, uh, it's, yeah. I'm pleased to do it and we have some work to do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We have a lot of work to do. Um, I guess, you know, let's just summarize what sort of evidence we are looking for uh, from victims. So, you know, I guess what we want victims to do is get the fill out the affidavit template and then get the evidence sorted and ready. Right. So it's it can be can be looked at and then maybe send it to us. I guess what we're interested in is things like if you have implants or evidence of implants, any you know x-rays or MRIs that show them, medical certificates that you have, maybe um, um, any other evidence. Some people can, for example, show in a little video that there's a hard little object under their skin that they can push around. You know, I've seen evidence like that. That's also telling. I have an implant like that that's palpable and actually quite visible under the skin. Um, otherwise, um, any sort of evidence of injuries, like the typical directed energy weapon burns and, and very strange bruises, you know, things like odd bruises in a, in a line. That's also very typical. Um, large bruises, very large burns, things like that. And otherwise, EMF measurements that you think, you know, show... Um, directed energy weapon attacks. Yeah. Is, is there anything else I left out here? Um, just one, and it's the one you and Bill did. If someone feels they are um, uh, being hit by sonic pulses, um, I would suggest they put out a sheet of aluminum foil something that would cause audible sound 
um, detectable by the human ear. If those pulses were to hit the aluminum foil, you should hear it yeah. or a metal plate, something that you have that you could use. Um, I think something solid rather than uh, perforated would be better for that. And then to describe the sensations, anything felt in terms of impacts, um, possible vibrations, uh, sonic uh, weapons can cause bones to resonate or vibrate. And so uh, that's interesting and something we're gonna be looking into more, but yeah. Yeah, I think actually the, the it's, it's good that you uh, mentioned the vibrations um, hang on, I, I think I managed to, I did something with the, with the view, oops, oh dear, I, I clicked on the view and some, suddenly we all look different, so I apologize to my viewers. Um, yes, I, I think it's very, very important that you mentioned the, the vibrational effect is something that a lot of victims report, also feeling effects in the bone, I completely share that, I can actually feel sometimes beams scanning up and down my bones and I feel reverberation in my bones. Mm. I guess the other thing we should also stress is that um, when people write down anecdotal evidence or, or symptoms as they experience it, there is a value in that, but it has to be systematic somehow. So it has to be, you know, with day, date and time, and one has to be able to assess very quickly how often it's felt, how unusual it is. And I would always say, write down anything that is, is unusual and indicates that isn't, it isn't just a temporary little ache. And know? when did it start and when did it end? Yeah, yeah. And as we get more um, refined, you know, I think with time we'll be able to identify the typical uh, weapon symptoms. And my experience is that they stick out like a sore thumb and they do not look like normal illnesses. And it's, it's also quite telling when victims go to doctors, doctors have no idea what this is. They've never met it before. So they typically make up four or five illnesses that they claim the victim has simultaneously because they're desperately trying to, to squash the data into the already existing, you know, previously existing grid of known symptoms for a disease. And if it doesn't fit one, maybe it's four diseases together. Exactly. But the problem with that analysis, of course, is that having one disease has a certain probability having four rare diseases at the same time is almost impossible. So, you know, <laughs> it's targeting as much becomes much more likely. True. Okay, so is there anything else that you guys would like to say or ask the, the victims to do to insist the investigation? Well, I would invite people um, to contact us if they have questions about any circumstances we have not mentioned during this video. We, we haven't covered the entire spectrum. So, and there's still more for us to discover. So um, I would ask people who have substantive concerns, questions, please ask, let us know. You may help us stumble across something very important. Yeah. <clears throat> Bill, do you have something? Uh, no, except that uh, we will uh, continue to try to, to develop techniques to be able to detect these things and uh, and assemble evidence for court cases. Uh, and we'll let everybody know if we come across things that actually work so that they too can use that and uh, and build their own case. And, and one afterthought um, for these folks that are, are being targeted, um, with sonic or RF based energies. I would say, be aware of what's going on around your house, externally, next door, two doors down. I wouldn't overly worry about things from satellites in the sky. Pay more attention to your close environment. Has a new building gone up? Did somebody add a garage or an outbuilding? Um, just, it, it just may be important. It may not, but it may be. Yeah, that's, that, that's, I think, completely backed up by, you know, what I've experienced and what, you know, other victims have reported, including mm -hmm. Karen Melton Stewart. She noticed that a lot of stuff was st suddenly started happening in her immediate neighborhood and community. 
one thing I would like to add, though, because I, <laughs> I've just realized, we, so we are inviting people to, you know, contact us. The one thing I have to say is I think all of us, we get such a deluge of emails that we need some sort of help sorting. OK, so I would like to say that any affidavits that are submitted, finished, completed affidavits, they go to a separate uh, set of email um, accounts, mm. which are dedicated only to the affidavits. Yes. Um, and those emails are given in the explanatory notes, you know, the PDF document that I've um, shown. Any other questions that people might have, you know, but please be patient because it's sometimes physically impossible to answer all those questions, right, should go to our normal um, email addresses. Now, my email address is contact at stop007.org. So you can send it there, but please be patient because I think my current unread email stand at 4,700. So I have to kind of prioritize you know, I have to tell apart junk from important stuff. So if you are sending evidence where you're saying, look, this is an x-ray or this is a whatever Melinda Kidder report or this is another photograph of, you know, brutal burns that I want you to see, please write evidence in the subject line because otherwise, you know, it's just gets lost in hundreds Amen. of emails. Yep. So um, uh, this is what I would like to say. So please be aware we are all working to our capacity. We are each one of us is another, you know, load on our lives and our, you know, uh, that we have to deal with as we're trying to do this. But, um, you know, the bottom line is we are working towards court cases that my court case is running right now. We're doing our utmost to collect evidence. Please help us with, get, with getting really scientifically sound evidence and please help us by filling out the affidavit template. Indeed. Okay. Thank, well, thank you very much to you, Kirk and Bill. You have no idea what this means, uh, you know, to us targeted individuals to have you two on board. And, and I'm so grateful for everything that you have done in the past, also the huge personal sacrifices that you have, um, you know, um, undertaken to support not just the targeted community, but especially the humanity in general, you know. We're pleased to do it. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And I'm very, very much looking forward to this collaboration. Great. So thank you for coming on. And as we said, we'll keep the community updated about any progress um, that, we'll, that we'll make. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you to you once more. Yeah. And thank you to my listeners. And uh, yeah, stay tuned and hope we will we'll be able to tell you more soon. <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Thank you.